everyone, this is Darwell20, and welcome to a brand new mod spotlight. Today, taking a look at nuclear craft. What better place to do a nuclear mod spotlight than in the desert? Probably a good idea. Uh, nuclear craft is a really, really cool mod. Um, it's all about generating RF power using uh, nuclear fuel. And there's fission reactors, there's fusion reactors, there's salt reactors and turbines and all kinds of crazy stuff. Um, if you've seen any of my Let's Play series, you've seen me play with this mod a little bit in a couple of my Let's Play series, and I really liked it enough. I said we need to do a mod spotlight on this because there's a lot of complexity to the mod. Um, there, if, if you're not looking for doing the complexity of it, there's details online on websites where you can go to find just efficient designs that people have come up with, and it's pretty straightforward. Um, but also, if you are looking for the complexity and you are looking for some like really cool, like get into the weeds and play with all the mechanics of it, the mod has a lot of complicated mechanics that are really cool to play with. So again, if you're looking for simple, you can find the information online and just say like Google good reactor design and you're done, right? But uh, you can also come up with some really cool stuff um, playing with it on your own. So we're going to check out all the facets of nuclear craft, probably in a multi-part spotlight here. Today we're going to focus on fission reactors, which is one of the three types of reactors. Like I said, there's fission, salt, and fusion. Let's get started checking out this cool mod. So to get started off with, uh, nuclear craft adds quite a few ores to the world. Um, typically what you'll find is lithium, boron, uranium, thorium, and magnesium. The magnesium, boron, and lithium are crafting components, and the uranium and thorium are used for nuclear fuel, and we'll get into the details of that just shortly. In addition, you might find things like copper, tin, lead. Uh, as well. However, depending on the mod pack you're playing in, that might be substituted for some other mods versions of copper, tin, and lead. But just note that they are also included in the mod. The mod also comes with a whole host of machines. Uh, one of them, for example, is the nuclear furnace. It's pretty cool. Uh, you can use uranium as a fuel source, which you can just uh, pretty much get by uh, smelting uranium ore, or if you have some other mods installed, um, you can do the standard ore processing mechanics like grinding into dust and all that cool stuff, right? So there's definitely ore doubling mechanics available to you um, if, you're, if you're up for it. Um, so with that in mind, uh, you can use your uranium ingots. The nuclear furnace is actually really a fast furnace. It's pretty nice. Um, and you'll get basically about half a stack worth of uh, smelting, so 32 smelting operations per uranium ingot. Um, it's, you know, usually by the time you get into nuclear power, you might not need a better smelter, but it's definitely a good option. In addition to that, there are many, many machines that are involved in the processing and crafting of all the things you'll need to get into nuclear reactors. Now, I'm not gonna focus on many of these machines, but most of them are similar in the way that they work. All of their recipes are available in uh, JEI. So for example, if you just hit the U on uh, Manufactory here, you'll see that you can turn coal into pulverized coal, pulverized coal into graphite dust, right? Um, and there's a handful of other recipes that uh, you can see you can get from the manufactory, right? Um, and similar things for like the isotope separator and the decay hastener and the fuel reprocessor. Some of these we will cover, some of these maybe not. The alloy furnace, very simple. Works like most other alloy furnaces we've seen in other mods, right? Copper plus 10 equals bronze. The machines do have some interesting mechanics though that I want to cover. Uh, so first off, the manufactory, uh, which we'll take a look at here with that coal recipe that we talked about. Simply insert item, get output. However, there are upgrade slots available, and the upgrades work as such. You can place speed upgrades in there to increase, increase the processing speed of the machines, basically make them run faster. And you can also throw energy upgrades in there to decrease the energy consumption. As you increase the speed, it'll increase the energy consumption. So for example, right now, 20 RF a tick. We throw a speed upgrade in there, and now it's using 80 RF a tick, but it's running much more quickly, right? If we throw an energy upgrade in there, now we're down to 40 RF a tick. Okay, so 20 with no upgrades, 80 if you just put a speed upgrade in, 40 if you put both a speed and energy upgrade in. Um, however, it should be noted here that you can't put too many speed or energy upgrades in. Pretty much they are meant to balance out the speed upgrades. So you can keep throwing all the energy upgrades in there that you want. You're not going to drop below that 40 that you get with just one. However, if you put a second speed upgrade in there, we're at 90. A second energy upgrade in there, we're at 60, right? And if you want to throw a whole stack in there, be my guest, right? You're using 1300 RF a tick to process, but it's really quick. In addition, all your machines have a redstone control, by default disabled, but you can make it require redstone to run. 
Uh, and you can also configure the sides. So you can choose each of the different slots that are available and choose which sides you can input from. So by default, you can input from any side. So any items going into this machine through piping or hoppers or anything like that will be allowed in. However, if you want to disable the input, you can do so like this. And the output slot has one extra setting that you can specify what happens to excess items. So by default, it just fills up like you would expect a machine to. And uh, when we throw uh, this guy in here, this extra coal, it's not gonna process because the output is full. However, with the side config of the output with void excess, you'll see it's running now and it's just voiding any excess stuff that shows up. So once we fill up a stack, it'll void the excess. And then finally, the last configuration here is void all, which means it'll just void anything it creates. Obviously not something you'd want to do in a manufactory. However, if you're doing something like processing fluids and you want to void uh, some excess oxygen that you don't need, uh, you could definitely do that and not have to worry about piping the oxygen somewhere. Specifically here, I'm talking about the electrolyzer. So the electrolyzer is one of the machines that's meant to electrolyze fluids into different things. And you can see there's quite a lot of fluids that are made available in this mod. Really, 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 really lots and lots of fluids. 21 pages, most of them are all around nuclear craft fluids. The most basic one is water. And when we get to the fusion spotlight, we'll see that we can use hydrogen uh, to, to, to power our, our fusion generators. Um, we also get a side effect of deuterium and oxygen uh, from each bucket of water that we process. So we may, for example, want to say void any excess oxygen, but, you know, store all the hydrogen and dump that somewhere. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on all these different machines because they all have basically different crafting recipes to get you going in the mod. However, as we go through and look at different features of the mod and how to use some of the things, we might touch on them again. Now, because we've pretty much covered the basics of all machines, right? There's tons of them to look at and they all do different things. Next up, we wanna start looking at fission reactors, which is gonna be the main focus of this part of the spotlight. How to build and create efficient, powerful, and non explodey destroy fission reactors. So fission reactors in this, uh, in this mod can melt down and cause negative effects, but they're not gonna to be too bad depending on some of the configuration options you have. They won't explode, however, they will melt down and start leaking out fluids and potentially cause radiation issues. And we'll talk about radiation a little bit later in this guide. Nuclear reactors are made with fission reactor casings on the outside, one fission controller to handle the controls of the fission reactor, and a fission reactor port typically, which is used to extract energy out of a fission reactor. I think you can extract energy out of the fission controller as well if you want, but this gives you another place to extract it from. The, that forms the outside of a fission reactor. The inside of the fission reactor can be filled with many, many, many different types of blocks all of which will affect how the fission reactor runs. So we're gonna start with the most basic fission reactor possible. At the very least, you need a reactor cell. Reactor cells are what actually burn the fuel, not really burn, but you know what I mean, inside of a fission reactor. So as such, you must have a reactor cell inside your reactor in order for it to do something, right? So what I'm gonna start off with is just a single reactor casing. The internals of your reactor must be completely surrounded on all sides by fission reactor casings. So if you want to have just a one by one reactor, and that's measured by the number of blocks inside the reactor. So one by one means there's one block inside the reactor. A three by three by three means that there's a three by three by three space inside the reactor, not counting the fission reactor casings. Okay, so this is the most basic fission reactor you can have. It's really not a good one. It's actually quite bad but you're gonna see the basics. Um, so having the fission reactor casings like this, you basically wanna stick your fission controller somewhere in a corner like that. And that will give you a fission reactor. Look, it says one by one by one because that's the size of the internal, right? And we can go ahead and throw fuel in there if we want and see what happens. Speaking of fuel, there's quite a lot. There are literally dozens of different types of nuclear fuel available to you, all of which have different properties. Um, the two main properties that we're gonna concern ourselves with are going to be the total amount of RF we can get, the RF per tick we can get is measured uh, based on some other attributes, right? Um, and the amount of heat that's generated, right? So basically there's three stats on every type of fuel uh, that we can look at that's gonna, that's gonna measure pieces of information for us. Generally speaking, uh, the more RF that you get out of a fuel, the more heat it's going to generate. One of the most basic fuel types is called LEU-235, and this stands for Low Energy Uranium-235. There's also HEU-235, which is High Energy Uranium, but we'll talk about that one a little bit later. 
Generally, when you're starting with nuclear craft, this is probably the first fuel you're going to make. And it's made of uranium-235 and eight other uranium-238s. Don't worry about the oxide for now. We'll talk about that a little bit later. So eight uranium-238s and one uranium-235. In order to get these guys, we need to process some of our fuel or some of our uranium that we found in the ground. So there's a handful of different ways to handle this, right? And we're going to mainly see that the way to do that is with the isotope separator. So we want to take a uranium ingot that we got underground from mining up our uranium ore, processing it somehow, either smelting it or, or doubling it with some kind of stuff, and throw it in an isotope separator. And when we do that, you'll see that it'll start processing. And just like before, you can speed this guy up with a little bit of speed upgrades. And what we'll typically get from a single uranium ingot is a uranium-238 piece, a big one, and a little tiny clump of uranium-235. Now, LEU-235 fuel needs just one little bit of uranium-235 and eight uranium-238s. So you can see already that this is a pretty good ratio, right? So if we got some more nuclear uh, fuel, some more uranium ingots, right? And we threw them in there, we shouldn't have too much of a problem getting ourselves the appropriate amount of stuff. So we're gonna need, uh, in total, for our crafting table, we wanna take those tiny clumps, nine of them, We'll get a normal size clump. We take that uranium-235, combine it with some 238s, and we get our first LEU-235 fuel, which stacks with the one that I snagged out of uh, JEI just a minute ago. The attributes on this fuel will tell us information about how it's going to generate power inside of our fission reactor. We can see things like base process time. That's how long this will run if there's only one fuel cell and no moderator blocks. Moderator blocks we'll talk about in a minute. Right? And we can also see the amount of RF per tick that will generate, which is 120, and the base heat generation, which will be 50 heat units per tick. Now, right now, our fission reactor, because it just has a fuel cell in it, has no way to deal with heat. So this is probably going to be bad. You can see there's two bars on the left-hand side here. Energy. So this tells you how much energy is stored in the internal capacitors of the fission reactor, how much power is currently being generated, obviously zero because there's no fuel in there, and the amount of efficiency, which we'll also talk about. In addition, you can see the other bar is the heat. This is the amount of heat currently in there, which is zero, and the total heat storage, which is 25,000. If you start going above this number, you're gonna have some problems. And your total amount of heat generation, and the cooling rate, and the heat multiplier, all attributes that are affected by the internals of the reactor. Because the reactor only has one fuel cell in it, there's really no internals to modify your heat. Now, if we go ahead and throw some LEU-235 in there, you're going to see it's going to immediately eat up that fuel, and we're going to be able to see how long it's going to last in just a moment once we turn this guy on. But it's also going to change the attributes that we are looking at. So we can see it's telling me with the LEU-235 here, with one cell, we're going to be generating 120 RF a tick and 50 heat units a tick because that's your base, right? And now to turn this guy on, all we need is a lever, some kind of redstone signal to tell him to run. And he's running, look, and we're generating power at 120 RF a tick, and we're also generating heat at 50 heat per tick because we have no cooling, which is a problem, right? If that thing gets too high, it's bad news. Let's turn off the reactor, and you'll see uh, right now, because there's no cooling, it's not even gonna cool itself down when off. It's just maintaining all that heat. That's probably a pretty bad time for us. This is why a one by one reactor is not ideal. So let's go ahead and make it a little bit bigger. I'm gonna throw another reactor cell in there. Hey, that sounds like a good time. And we're gonna throw some fission casings. Remember, you just have to surround all the internals with fission casings, right? So now if we take a look at this fission controller, we'll see that there are two cells and there's no fuel in there because we broke the fission reactor controller, which stored that fuel. So we basically reset the thing and we lost the fuel that we had. Wah, wah. And we can see again, there's still no cooling in there because we haven't done anything with cooling yet. Now remember, this has a base power of 120 RF a tick and a base heat of 50. But now because there's two cells in there, when we go ahead and throw this guy in there, we will see four times uh, the, the RF per tick and six times the heat. So basically what's happening when you place fuel cells next to each other, uh, they multiply each other in such a way that you get much more RF and way more heat. Bad news, but don't worry, there's more to this than you think. So now when we turn this thing on, you'll see our heat levels rising even more quickly than the energy. But we're generating 480 RF a tick, which isn't bad. But we're also still not cooling, which is bad. So let's get a cooler in there. There are two ways to cool a fission reactor, passive cooling and active cooling. And they work exactly as you probably think. 
Passive cooling just cools the reactor without using any resources. It just sits there and it cools. That's it. And active cooling requires resources to be fed into it. So there are multiple kinds of, of uh, active and passive cooling materials available. Uh, one example is water. It's the most basic uh, one available. So you'll need to get yourself an empty cooler and then fill it with water, either by crafting it with a water bucket or using the fluid infuser from Nuclear Craft. The uh, water cooler here, if you hold shift on it, will tell you some information. Cooling rate, 60 heat per tick. Sounds great. There's one other note, however, for coolers is there are rules about where you're allowed to place a cooler inside of a reactor. As you can see, there are many, many different types of coolers with many different types of rules, some of which we'll cover in just a moment. But for the basics, understand that when you read the tooltip, it'll tell you the rule. The water cooler must be adjacent to at least one reactor cell or an active moderator block. And a moderator block we'll talk about in a moment. So in order to be adjacent to a water cell, it has to go here inside the reactor. It has to be adjacent to or touching a reactor cell. Well, there's our reactor cell, so we can throw our water cooler in there. Hooray, nice. Now we'll cover up our fission reactor and hook up the fission controller. Now, if we look at the stats, we'll see, just like it says, we have 60 heat per tick cooling. Nice. Well, that's pretty cool. And remember our LEU-235 fuel? It generated 50 heat. So guess what happens when I throw it in here? We have a net heat of negative 10, which means we are now having no problem running this reactor. And I can go ahead and turn this bad boy on. Sweet. And look, we're generating power, but we're not generating heat. Because the uranium fuel generates 50 heat, but the water cooler does a minus 60 for a net heat generation of negative 10. In other words, we're cooling at 10 heat units per tick, which is great. It means we will never overheat this reactor. And this thing will just run and run and run. Pretty great. Fuel remaining, 60 minutes. So this is the most basic form of stable reactor that you could possibly hope for. Now, of course, this is only with LEU-235 fuel. There are other fuel types with different heat and variables. So you can see our efficiency currently is 100%, right? And we're still losing fuel because we filled up our internal buffer. So we're still gonna burn through all this fuel. So it would be smart to either store this in some kind of cell, which by the way, nuclear craft does have cells for storing energy. You've got voltaic cells and lithium ion batteries. So if we threw an elite lithium ion battery down here underneath this guy, we should see him start to fill up with RF. And he doesn't have a UI, but you can right click to see the amount of RF in there. It's measured in uh, thousands of RF, right? So we're sitting at a pretty, pretty decent amount of RF sitting there. Pretty cool. Um, and, uh, you know, we've got, we've got some good stuff here, right? Not too bad. Now, there's one other type of internal block that you can stick inside of a fission reactor that we haven't talked about yet. And that's a graphite block, which is a fission reactor moderator. Um, there's graphite, uh, ber beryllium. And um, there's also molten salt reactor something something, and we'll talk about that a little bit later. So molten or, or, or graphite blocks, which are moderators, will help to increase the efficiency of a reactor when placed next to at least one reactor cell. It increases the efficiency of the uh, reactor. So let's see what that means. So by throwing that in there, you'll see that we now again have one fuel cell. We don't have any heat cooling because we got rid of our water cooler, right? Now, if we take our LEU-235 fuel and throw it in there, we'll see that we're generating 140 RF a tick. Sweet. That's a little bit better. 20 more RF a tick than we had before from the base. But we're also generating more heat, 66 heat units per tick. Okay, cool. And if we look at the efficiency, it's at 116.7%, which means basically speaking, but see how the fuel time is still 60 minutes. So we're generating more RF a tick for the same period of time which means overall we're going to get more RF out of our individual fuel ingot, right? So we're getting more power faster, but it's also causing more heat. So when we turn this bad boy on, you know, once again, we're going to be building up heat at a rate of 66 heat units per tick. So a little bit more heat than we have before, but more efficiency. So moderator blocks are a nice way to get more energy out of your fuel and also increase the RF per tick. Super cool. Now, the only other thing to talk about before we get into a better reactor design is the fact that so far we've been playing around with the most basic fuel possible, right? LEU-235. So when we set this up in our fission controller, 
with our water block, we're totally fine on heat. We have no problem running this thing. However, there's other kinds of fuel. There's a lot of other kinds of fuel. And we'll get into some of them and what they do uh, and how to get them in just a moment. Uh, but the main thing to consider is each type of fuel has a different heat level. So if we wanted to do something fancier, right? So another way to get uh, using the uranium that we have access to so far might be uh, HEU-235, which is high energy uh, uranium fuel, okay? So HEU-235 is a more of a mix of 235 uranium. So remember the LEU was just one 235 and eight 238s. The HEU is four 235s and five 238s. Cool. That thing's a little bit more powerful. I lied. It's a lot more powerful. The base power gen is 480 RF a tick for 60 minutes as opposed to 120. But look at the base heat gen. It's 300 heat units per tick. So your HEU 235 is going to be a lot more um, power, but also a lot more heat. So our negative 60 water cooler is in no way going to be able to handle the 300 heat that's being put off by this stuff. So we have a net total of 240 now, right? 300 minus 60. 240. Pretty straightforward. So as you build your reactors, you're going to want to consider like, how do I build this in such a way that it's going to be able to handle the fuel that I want to use and also handle the heat that I've got? We'll figure it out. One option might be using active cooling. So if we take a look at the active cooler, we'll see that uh, the active fluid cooler, you have to pump coolant into the block to cool down your fission and fusion reactors. It must be placed in a fission structure. Um, and uh, there's some rules about it along with fusion as well, which we'll talk about in the next spotlight. But if we go ahead and toss this guy in here, which is pretty straightforward, we don't have to put any fluid in it yet. However, what we do need to have is a buffer, right? And a buffer is a way to transfer fluids um, into adjacent cells. So what I'm gonna do is stick that buffer right there. So if we look in here, we'll see that currently we're sitting at 300 heat units per tick being generated by that HEU-235, right? Nuclear craft, by the way, comes with its own water source. So I'm going to go ahead and grab one of those out of JEI. Pretty straightforward to make, you know, just a few recipes, right? The, the, the simple one generates 10 millibuckets per tick. You get eight of those and you get 80 and you get eight of those and you get 640. Nice. So if I place that down adjacent to it, he should be pumping water in. And we'll see that now with the active water cooler, we're able to cool things down by 150 heat units per tick definitely better than the 60 that we are getting from our passive water cooler. Now, water is the most basic cooler available. So, you know, you might be thinking, hey, you know, I can get some really good stuff. For example, there's a gelid cryothium if you happen to have uh, thermal expansion installed. The basic cooling rate is 160 heat units per tick for the passive, and it's like 4,000 or something huge for uh, the active. However, you got to keep pumping cryothium in to keep it cool. So those are some of the balancing acts you're going to need to look at. So we're going to start looking at this uh, in the spotlight. Let's create a let's create a better reactor than a simple one by two. We're going to create one of the most basic. Uh, stable reactors that'll work for you for a little bit. Um, it's, it's basically considered the tutorial version reactor, and it's a three by three by three reactor. Let's build it. So we're going to use lapis coolers, which has a better cooling rate than water. It's 120 heat units per tick, but it has to be adjacent to both a reactor cell and a reactor casing, right? Um, so what we're going to do is place uh, reactor cells in the corners here. And we're gonna have a total of eight of these, right? Then we're gonna place lapis coolers down like so, okay? And now the lapis coolers are adjacent to at least one cell and one casing. That means that they're valid. Good deal, okay? The next layer up, we're gonna throw down some graphite blocks on top of our reactor cells, okay? And remember, they're, mod they're, they're uh, moderators, so they have to be adjacent to at least one cell. And then in the middle of those, I'm going to use glowstone coolers. These are a pretty cool uh, cooler. Uh, they generate 130 heat units per tick of cooling per cooler, but they have to be adjacent to at least two active moderator blocks. So the moderator blocks are active because they're adjacent to a reactor cell, and each cooler has to be adjacent to two. So this one is adjacent to this one and this one, and this one's adjacent to this one and this one. So this is valid. If I removed this reactor cell here, this graphite block would no longer be active, which would mean that these coolers would no longer be valid because they're only adjacent to one graphite block. This one's no longer active, so it doesn't count. Keep that in mind. Cool. And then uh, the next level up, we're gonna go ahead and throw down more reactor cells. 
and more lapis coolers. This is considered the tutorial uh, reactor. It's a three by three by three internal. Um, and let's see what the stats are once I surround it in fission reactor casings. All right, looking pretty good. So let's pop down our fission controller and check out the stats. Wow, negative 1,480 heat units per tick. That's some pretty good cooling. But let's not forget that we've got four moderators in there and eight fuel cells. Is this enough to cool our LEU 235 fuel? Why, in fact, it just happens to be just right. So you'll notice this fuel with eight fuel cells, we've got an efficiency going on of 233%. So we're generating way more RF a tick and also as a result, way more power. But remember, because we have multiple fuel cells in there, we're burning through our fuel faster. So our fuel is only gonna last eight minutes rather than the 60 from before. But our efficiency is way up, right? So the 2240 RF a tick over eight minutes is way better than the basic 120 RF a tick over 60 minutes. Okay, um, and the heat being generated, right, uh, by this uh, fuel is gonna be pretty high. We have a good heat multiplier as a result of our multiple cells and our graphite moderators, but our cooling is gonna be able to handle it. So when we turn this bad boy on, we should have no problem running the fuel, right? And we're just generating 2,240 RF a tick over eight minutes, and that's pretty cool. And I'm gonna go ahead and get an energy trash can just to avoid all the energy being produced there. Perfect. Now in eight minutes, we'll have something cool to see. Now let's not forget that there's one other type of fuel that's available to you, and that is thorium right out of the world, okay? And if we go ahead and throw this in the isotope separator, we'll see thorium breaks down into thorium-232 and tiny clumps of thorium-230. Sweet. Thorium can be used to make TBU fuel, um, and it's generally just the 232, which is the larger size of the isotope that you get on the side, and that can go into a reactor for some specific needs. Um, specifically, once you um, process your fuel in a reactor, you're gonna get a depleted version of that, right? So you'll see that the TBU fuel goes in, and after it's done processing, you get a depleted version, which we'll see from our uh, LEU fuel here in about four minutes. All right, we got about 13 seconds left of fuel here. So in a moment, our three by three fission reactor is gonna finish burning up this fuel. So obviously the bigger your reactors, the faster they'll burn through fuel, uh, the more RF a tick they'll generate, and that's all good stuff. And burning through fuel is actually a good thing because once you've got your depleted fuel, we're gonna wanna go ahead and process that in a fuel reprocessor. So if we come over here to the fuel reprocessor, we can throw our depleted fuel in there and that's gonna go ahead and process that stuff. And let's get a few speed upgrades to help make that a little bit better. Whoosh. Now, once that's done, we get some tiny clumps of uranium-238 back, which we can use to turn back into uranium-238, which we got before. And also some neptunium from this guy. Sweet. We also got some plutonium and uh, another type of plutonium. So as you process your fuels, you're going to be able to turn them into other types of radioactive materials that can be used to create other types of fuel. That's the long and the short of it. So now we've got, for example, Neptunium-247, sweet, which we can use uh, to, to get different types of fuel, like LEN, low energy Neptunium fuel. So HEN, high energy Neptunium fuel. So we've got Neptunium-236 and Neptunium-237 that go into this. So far, we've figured out where Neptunium-237 comes from, right? Uh, but to figure out where Neptunium-236 comes from, well, well, we're gonna have to dig through JEI just a little bit. Cool. So it looks like that comes from depleted high energy uranium 233, HU 233 fuel, uh, which we can totally get from a fission reactor process, right? And that's uranium 233 and 238. Cool. So lots of different types of fuels inside this mod. There are guides online on how to progress through the fuels. Like burn this one first and then burn this one and you'll get this fuel. And then you combine those two fuels to make another type of fuel that you'll burn to get the next one up. And there's many, many different types. So we've got the thoriums and uraniums, which we've looked at already. And then you get into neptunium and then you get into plutonium, which we already saw. And the plutonium goes up to, uh, eventually you get to americium and curium and berkelium and Californium. And that's some of the more radioactive stuff, right? And each different type of fuel that you're gonna be able to make with these different radioactive materials uh, is gonna have different stats, right? So if we look at, um, for example, uh, low energy Californium, LECF, right? That has a pretty decent amount of base power. 
uh, and a pretty decent heat gen, right? So different amounts of stuff and different attributes for each of these. Different ones with different numbers, right? In general, your LECFs, low energies, are gonna produce less power and less heat. Your high energies, H whatevers, right? Like, so HECF, H E uh, U, that kind of stuff, are gonna create uh, higher power uh, and more RF attack, right? So HEU 235, for example. So LEU 235 was 120 and 50 heat. And HEU 235 is 480 and 300 heat. That's the general rule. Now, in addition to that, there's oxided fuels, which are basically just slightly boosted. So you can see your HEU 235 is 480, 300. This is 672, 375. So actually a pretty decent increase in RF per tick for not much of an increase in heat. All you have to do to make that is take an existing HEU 235, throw it in a fluid infuser with oxygen, which we already saw you can make with the electrolyzer of water. So it's pretty much, you know, a little bit of processing and you get a fuel that burns a little bit hotter and generates much more energy. Pretty good way to go about things. So HEU 235 seems like a really nice way to go, but don't forget it's gonna burn through your heat a lot faster, right? This guy produces uh, a total of 7,320 heat per tick. Oh, and I got a nice, nasty metallic taste in my mouth. We just buffered up some radiation. Dun, dun, dun. Better get out the Geiger counter. The Geiger counter, there's an item version and a block version that'll let you measure the amount of radiation in a chunk. Ooh, we've got some decent radiation in this chunk. It's probably because I was carrying that HECF in my inventory though. See, each fuel type uh, emits a certain amount of radiation and carrying it around in your inventory is not a good idea unless you've got protection, which we'll talk about probably in the next spotlight. Um, so radiation is a whole mechanic around this mod that I definitely can't cover in episode one of the spotlight. We'll cover it in episode two. Just note that it's a thing. Uh, there are ways to protect yourself from radiation using shielding. And then if you do get radiated like I just did, there's a type of uh, item called a radaway which uh, as you can see right now in the bottom left of my screen, this is my player's radiation level and I can reduce it by eating some rat away. And that helps to cut down on the stuff. So we'll cover radiation entirely in another spotlight. And the Geiger counter sound we hear only happens when it's in your hot bar. So because I've got a bunch of different types of fuel in my inventory, my radiation spiked up a little bit, especially by putting the high energy fuel in there. HEU 235 is probably emitting a lot of radiation. Yeah, six and rads per tick, I guess that's a lot. I don't know. So turning on this fission reactor again, we're gonna see what happens when uh, when heat gets out of control, I guess. Oh boy, a little bit of meltdown. That's a problem. That's a real problem. Our fission reactor just melted down. Uh, these are just fluids in the world. So yes, of course, you can just you know place blocks down to get rid of those fluids. But it definitely makes a mess and it definitely destroyed a lot of the blocks inside the reactor. And touching this uh, fluid is probably uh, not a good idea. Not a good idea at all. Not good, wouldn't recommend it. Very bad, don't stand inside that fluid, right? So you need to clear away all these fluids. It basically melted a lot of the reactor casings into some nasty stuff. Um, we might be able to scoop this up with a bucket. I'm actually not sure, let's find out. Oh yeah, we can, cool. That is corium buckets, sweet. And the corium can be, uh, well, it's just bad. It doesn't really do anything good for you, aside from be a liquid that you can deal with. Cool. So that's what happens if a reactor melts down. It's not as bad as some other mods where, you know, it's going to explode and destroy your base, but I would definitely recommend trying to avoid it. And speaking of heat, it should probably be mentioned that uh, a comparator hooked up to your fission controller can emit a redstone signal whose strength is uh, determined by the amount of heat stored inside the fission reactor. Considering this thing needs a redstone signal to run, it should be pretty easy to set up a redstone control system to automatically turn the thing off when your heat gets too high. And let's not forget that, you know, a simple cooler inside should probably help. So I just went ahead and threw a lapis cooler in there, which is pretty nice and it helps to cool down the reactor. And you'll see the redstone signal starting to dissipate. Not too bad. So for example, I'll throw HEU 235 in there and uh, throw a little bit of redstone signal on. It'll rapidly heat up. And then when we turn it off, the heat will start to dissipate because with at least one cooler in there, it'll cool the reactor off um, when it's not running. So you could, if you wanted to, set up a little bit of redstone control. Hey, when it gets too hot, turn it off. And then when it's cooled off again, turn it back on. And then when it's cooled off, turn it off. Yada, yada, yada. So how you play with nuclear craft fission reactors is totally up to you. 
Uh, do you want to pump coolant in there to get some really hot fuels going? Do you want to build a really big reactor that's super cool? Up to you. So you can get some really big reactors. Uh, so here's an example of one uh, with a bunch of different coolant cells with a different bunch of different rules. Uh, there's lots of moderators and cells and lots of coolant going on inside. This is a nine by five by nine reactor. It's really quite big. Um, it's pretty much gonna be able to burn through your high energy unit fuel pretty quickly and generate lots of RF a tick for you, uh, you know, in the tens of thousands of RF a tick. Uh, but obviously it requires a lot of resources to create, but these are all passive coolers, which is nice. And there's a lot of different coolers in here that have a lot of different uh, attributes, like copper has to be at least adjacent to one uh, glowstone. So if you want uh, a copper cooler in there, you have to be touching a glowstone cooler that's working, a working valid glowstone cooler. Right. Uh, there's also redstone coolers in there that have to be adjacent to a reactor cell. Quartz coolers have to be adjacent to a moderator block. So you can see lots of different coolers with lots of different cooling rates and lots of different rules. So I think that's probably a good point to wrap up uh, the episode here. So let's wrap up part one of the Nuclear Craft Mod Spotlight. We pretty much covered how fission reactors work, how to use them, how to build them, how to make them efficiently, and all the different ways you can do it. Like I said, there are uh, guides online that will help you to build things like this. So if you're looking to, hey, I don't want to get into the deep complexities of this mod, I just want a cool reactor. If you Google it, there's wikis on, on Nuclear Craft and it'll tell you, hey, here's a design for a really good reactor. And then you can build it and you're good to go. There's also a nuclear reactor planner, which I'll probably touch on in part two of the spotlight that helps you build these as well, uh, which is a pretty cool little third party gadget if you wanna be able to you know, run that and, and play with it outside of Minecraft. For now, Dial20 signing off. Hope you guys enjoyed this mod spotlight. Take it easy.